Hello, and welcome to Explore Classroom. My name is Gina Borgia. I work at the National Geographic Society in Washington, D.C., and I will be your host today. At National Geographic, we believe that anyone can be an explorer and that you have the power to make a difference in the world, no matter how old you are. Explorer Classroom is here to inspire you with stories from the field and connect you with our National Geographic Explorers live to answer your questions. Before we get into today's lesson, I'd like to welcome all of the classes who are joining us today, especially Knock Primary, Discovery Elementary, Morristown Upper Elementary, Hoffman Boston, Wilcox Elementary, Barker Middle School, West End School District, Victorious Homeschool, Armijo Elementary, Ilaho Royal School, Lafayette Regional, and Elk Grove Unified School District. We're so happy you're joining us today. And today, our explorer is Giovanni Chimienti. Giovanni is a zoologist, marine biologist, and scuba diver who studies coral and deep sea environments. Giovanni lives in Italy, where he is a researcher at the University of Bari, but his work takes him all over the world and to different depths of the ocean to study coral habitats. Recently, he and his team were in Indonesia investigating the health of a type of deep sea coral called black coral. So Giovanni will be joining us live from his home base very soon, but first he will be taking us into the field and underwater for a glimpse at the black coral habitat in Indonesia. Let's connect with Giovanni. Hi, I'm Giovanni Chimienti, marine biologist and National Geographic explorer studying corals. And I'm today here in Raja Ampat, Indonesia, to assess the conservation status of coral reef, in particular to study black corals. And why these places are so important? Well, they have a huge biodiversity with some very nice animals. If you don't believe me, just come with me and check. Wow. Okay, I bet many of you are eager to dive back into the water and explore with Giovanni, and something tells me that we might have an opportunity to do that soon. But first, let's welcome Giovanni to Explore Classroom. Giovanni, please say hello to the students. Hi. Hello, everyone. Ciao. Hello. <laughs> Ciao, Giovanni. We are so excited to have you here. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Okay, can you tell us a little bit more about the work that you do and why it's important? Well, yeah, I, as you said, thank you for this great introduction. Uh, I study corals and corals are animals, animals that live on this planet since millions of years. They are on our planet, uh, even they, they appeared on our planet even before dinosaurs. So they have been through a lot. But now, due to human activities, they are suffering in some cases. And we still know very little about corals because when you think about corals, you of course you think about the coral reef. So if you have ever been snorkeling or diving on a beautiful coral reef, you know, you think about that. But just think that more than half of the species of corals do not live on a coral reef, but they live much deeper in what we call the twilight zone, which is that area of seabed, usually below 50, 60 meters depth, where light starts to be really low. So the, the habitat, it's a bit more dark, it's cold waters, currents are much stronger, but life can be incredibly uh, lush, incredibly beautiful. And so I study mostly corals at this depth. And at this depth, you don't find only the usual corals you see on coral reef, but corals start to look like more like trees. So they, we say, we scientists, we say they are arborescent. It means they look like trees. And these corals are mostly what we call sea fans or at this depth, what it's really 
uh, interesting to me are black corals. Uh, uh, black corals that at this greater depth can, can live. And my goal is to find this specific coral. Wow, okay, thank you for sharing a bit more about your incredible work. Okay, students, now who wants to learn more about black coral? We saw a glimpse of the coral earlier when Giovanni took us to Indonesia, and now it's up here on your screen for you. So this is black coral. Take a look at this picture. Students, our question for you is, why do you think black coral is called black coral? Take a look at the poll on your screen and choose the best answer. So teachers, go ahead and type the letter that your students choose into the chat. Again, the question is, why do you think black coral, this is black coral, why is it called black coral? Is it A, it changes color when it's stressed? B, it's black when it's young? C, the inside or the skeleton is black? Or D, it lives in dark places? I'll give all the students a second to start thinking of your answer. Why is black coral called black coral? Okay, I'm seeing some are saying D, it lives in dark places. Great guess. Any other thoughts? Wilcox wildcats are saying D, it lives in black places. I'm seeing, oh, we have some A's, it color changes when it's stressed. Or B, it's black when it's young. These are great guesses. Let's see if we have any. Okay, now we've got one for every <laughs> single answer. So we're split across the board here, Giovanni. <laughs> Let's see if any answers are coming in from YouTube. I'm seeing a lot of Ds. So a lot of students thinking it gets its name because it lives in dark places. So thank you so much for all of these answers, but I'm not gonna tell you, we have the expert here. So I'm gonna pass the mic back to Giovanni. Why are black coral called black coral? Thank you, thank you, Gina. So I can see 25% of each, of each reply, of each possibility. And this is a great picture about how confusing it's the situation about black corals, how we little know about these corals. Well, and you know, black corals actually, they live all over the world and they can be usually white in color, like this one in the picture. Sometimes they can be green, they can be yellow, they can be red, a few of them can be blue, but there's only one color they never display, which is black, actually. So this can be a little bit confusing. They are never black in color, but it's their skeleton that is black. So the inside of the coral is black. And if you look at the, at the skeleton, like in this picture, this is one of the black corals I uh, recently studied, the skeletal is black due to a protein. So differently from other corals, if you have ever seen a coral, usually the skeleton is white because it's made of calcium carbonate, which is not that different compared, for example, to our bones. While the skeletal of the black corals is black due to a specific protein that makes the skeletal at the same time resistant as all other corals, but flexible. And so that means that's a good adaptation of this coral to live in very strong uh, water current condition, which is not good to me uh, that I have to go in really tough places to study these animals. And that's probably one of the reasons why these corals are probably the less known among the corals. They are much more difficult to study because they live under very strong current. Mm -hmm. uh, diving deep uh, to study black corals, it's really challenging. You need to be uh, quite expert and well trained because the currents are really strong. And so these corals are, thanks to their black skeleton, they are uh, used and they are adapt. To, to live under, under strong current. And so this is the skeleton, but also they live in deep areas. So even people who said uh, they live in dark place, well, this is not why they are called black corals, but that's true. They live in dark places. Usually they don't like light. So they live in dark places. They live very deep. Most of the times it's too deep for human beings to go. And so we need uh, some robots. We need technology to go explore like this one. This is my ROV. ROV stands for remotely operated vehicle, which is a vehicle that I pilot from the boat and it's my eye underwater. So this vehicle is easily able to reach 2000 meters, 3000 meters of depth 
and I can see live, like you're seeing me now live, I can see live the seabed below me at 2,000, 3,000 meters of depth. And this one in particular is exploring uh, black coral forest because corals, black corals under some circumstances, they can live one close to the other, many different colonies. And so they form what we call a black coral forest. It's called a, a forest. You can see why, because these, these animals look like trees. And in this forest, like in woodland forest, you can find a very high biodiversity. So this is the place where a lot of species go to find shelter, or food, or to lay their eggs. So for us, it's really important to study and to observe this place. And to observe it, so we need an ROV. The ROV, as you can see, it has motors, it has a manipulator arm if I need to collect sample and to do any other different work at that depth. And of course, very strong, powerful lights because it's dark down there and a very good camera. And thanks to the camera, I can see the corals live and I can film them uh, in order to work and to analyze this habitat, to describe it, to unveil every possible secret about this really uh, beautiful remote uh, ecosystem on our planet. And maybe if you're curious and eager to see what a black coral forest look like through the camera, through the lens of my ROV, probably we have some spoiler for you. And this is how a black coral forest looks like. So imagine to be underwater, under crush, crushing pressures, in deep waters, cold waters with a lot of currents. You can see these corals, how they move, look like trees under a storm. And this is more or less the feeling of being down there. This is our planet. So on our planet, there are ecosystems like this one down there in the ocean. And it looks like a, like a forest of the wonders, you know, with all these big trees that actually are animals. And so they eat, they live, and they live one close to the other. And as you can see, they create an ecosystem full of colors under the canopy of the forest. It's full of corals full of corals because a lot of different animals find shelter there. And so these ecosystems are, that's why are really important from a conservation point of view, because we need to protect these places, to protect all this biodiversity. So I don't know how many different forests have you seen in your life, but I'm sure a forest of this kind, you have never seen it before because this, for example, was unseen. This is one of the black coral forests I've recently discovered and we were the first people in the world in history ever to see this specific corner of the world. So this is these are images that have never been filmed before, but show us how beautiful and how peculiar could be our 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 planet. And we can go. I mean, I, I'm so passionate about black corals and deep sea exploration that I can go through these videos for hours. But I'm afraid we should move on, and we should move on probably talking about how important these are for biodiversity for associated species. This is, this is for example, uh, a, a sea fan. So in this black coral forest, we can find a lot of fish, a lot of crustaceans, a lot of other different organisms, but also many other different corals like this one. Sea fans are different from black corals, but they can live together with them sometimes. And what I really love about corals, and this can give you an insight about how important they are. So you look at the sea fan. This specific one was something like um, one meter and a half uh, large, more or less. But if you go really close, really, really close, you can see how important they are for biodiversity because close to the small, tiny polyps of this coral, for example, there was this guy and many other of these species. You recognize what it is, right? It's a seahorse. Actually, one of the smallest seahorse species in the world. They, I, I took this picture less than two months, uh, less than two months ago in Indonesia, for example. And this is um, one of those pygmy seahorses. So very small seahorses that during evolution they adapted to have exactly the same color of the corals they live on, and they can spend all their life on, on the same coral. It's and this specific sea fan had something like 10 to 15 seahorses. So it's a sort of, of big apartment for this for this species. 
And the beauty of black coral forests and coral forests in general is that bio they are very important for biodiversity. It's full of life. And you can go from the really small, like this guy, to the big, like turtles and sharks. All the big animals, too, they use coral forest to find their food, for example, to find their prey. This turtle, uh, this beautiful turtle eats mostly sponges, for example. And so she goes searching for sponges among the, the, the coral forest where you can find some sponges. So these habitats are really important for all kinds of marine animals from the smallest to the largest. Wow, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us and taking us underwater. So students, we, we just saw a black coral forest up close and we learned that deep sea coral, like black coral, are so important because they create an extensive habitat for many other types of marine life, like the sea fan, the seahorse, sea turtle, just to name a few. So thank you so much, Giovanni, for sharing all of that with us. Thank you. Yeah, so students, Let's think about the types of habitats that exist in other parts of the world and maybe near you. So we're gonna do a fun activity, but we're going to close our eyes to do this. So, okay, everyone, close your eyes. Are they closed? Okay, let's take a deep breath. And now that we're centered, I'd like you to picture the different types of habitats that exist where you live. Can you picture it? Maybe you live near a forest or a beach or a park or maybe near a river or a lake. Do you have a place in mind? Now think about the animals or plants that you notice in these areas. Why do they live where they live? Why do you think animals depend on these habitats? Okay, now open your eyes. And I want you to tell your teachers what you noticed. Teachers, you can type in those answers into the chat bar. So once again, I'm wondering, why do you think animals depend on the habitat that you were picturing? So while you're telling your teacher, I'll share with you what I was picturing. I live near the Chesapeake Bay in Maryland in the United States, which is home to lots of different life, like oysters and crabs and birds. And they depend on the bay to provide them what they need to live, like food. Okay, I'm seeing some answers come in. Mrs. Black's class is saying they saw trees and grass. Maybe we're thinking that a habitat is important because it provides food, shelter, maybe animals that need water, space to roam. All right, some, some students were seeing beaches. They see sea turtles laying their eggs. The fourth graders from New Hampshire, they live in White Mountain National Forest. They see bears, moose, deer, coyote. This is great. What else? Let's see what folks on YouTube are saying. They live near a pond. Okay, they see roadrunners. They see roadrunners. That's awesome. All right. Thank you so much for these answers and for doing this exercise with me. Okay, Miss Lee's environmental STEM class. They see fish, gulls, turtles. They depend on Lake Michigan. Wilcox wildcats. They use habitats to hide and protect themselves. This is great. Squirrels depend on trees for nuts. These are such great answers, students. You are all spot on right? Animals and plants, they live where their basic needs are met, just like us. They stay where they can find things like food and water, shelter, space, all of those examples that you were giving. When a habitat decreases or gets smaller, it can impact the animals that depend on it. So if a habitat disappears completely, it can even cause a species to become extinct. And this is why it's so important to conserve different habitats around the world, including the black coral forest. And so speaking of conservation, Giovanni, could you tell us a little bit more about your conservation efforts? Like once you return from a trip out to the field to study the coral habitats, what do you do next? Thanks, thank you for this question. Thanks to the students for these great answers. 
it happens like my concern about black coral forest it's really intuitive it's like if you think about going through the answers if the white mountain national forest will disappear due to fire maybe i don't know or due to someone just cutting it what will happen to the bears moose deers and coyote they will disappear too so if we lose the ecosystem if we lose the habitat we will lose everything else and that's the same the, the same concern i have about deep sea corals the difference is that the white mountain national park is there it's easy to to see and to recognize if something happened in the deep sea it's also far from our eyes so it's much more difficult to realize and so my work is not limited to just the discovery so going to places to remote places and search for this beautiful ecosystem is just the first step. Then we try to understand which one are the priorities for conservation. So which are the best one, the richest, the most important for the whole world ecosystem, for the health of our ocean. And then we work to protect it. So I personally work with policymakers, with and then depending from place to place, so or national, international organization, trying to protect these places. So first of all, we have to understand if there are any threats, which are these threats, for example, fisheries, or so troll fishing, uh, or deep sea mining, or climate changes. And then we try to find a solution to protect this specific place towards this threat. So for example, for black coral forest, we know that the main problem now is deep sea trolling. So deep sea trawlers, are a specific category of fishermen. They use uh, nets going really deep and uh, drift uh, that that are you know uh, trolled on the seabed, and they basically destroy everything they found. So there is some areas where this fishing practice could be done, maybe on muddy bottom, on sandy bottoms. But when you have corals this practice is banned or should be banned. And so we try to make sure that no destructive fishing practice occur in places where coral are, for example. Thank you for that example. Um, and it's so important. Students, if you're like me, you might be asking yourself, what can I do to help? So I have another activity for us. And this time we're gonna put ourselves in Giovanni's shoes. So I'd like you to close your eyes again. And this time, imagine you are exploring a coral forest. So you are underwater. What do you see? Maybe you see different types of marine life, like the sea turtle, the seahorse, different kinds of fish, vibrant colors of the coral. And maybe seeing this biodiversity inspires you to protect the coral that all of this life calls home just like Giovanni does. Okay, now open your eyes. Welcome back from the coral forest. You're back on land. My question is, what would you do to help keep life thriving in the black coral forest? Students, you can share your answers with your teachers and teachers type your answers into the chat. For example, I was thinking how we could spread the word about the importance of these habitats to others so that others will want to protect these special areas. So doing my part through education, but there are so many things you can do. So let's hear from you students. What would you do to keep life thriving in the black coral forest? I'll wait a beat to get some student answers. I know you're all typing and excited to tell your teachers. Yes, yes. Give me some new ideas, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, become the experts right alongside Giovanni. <laughs> All right. I know this. It was a meaty question. So we've got some good answers coming in. Okay, the Wilcox Wildcats are saying keep pollution from getting into waterways by disposing of it correctly. That's a great answer. Roadrunners, Isaac is saying, try to designate it as a national forest. Yeah, in your case. Mrs. Black's class is saying, don't litter. The fourth graders from New Hampshire, they're talking about outreach posters and flyers to help clean up trash from the ocean. Reef sunscreen, use less plastic. 
What do you think about some of these options, Giovanni? Well, they are great. They are great. And you guys are rocking it because you got exactly what's the problem and what the solutions could be. And this is this is great to, to read. You you are all right. You are all right. From dissemination to education, you know, tell friends, make books, pamphlets, posters, from dissemination, ocean education, ocean literacy to action. Don't litter. You know, try to de designate as a national forest so protect it or keep pollution from getting into waterways. That's that are all really good solutions. These are so many wonderful ideas about how we can all take action, however small. It it will make a big impact. Yeah, absolutely. And for those seeing, we would like to clean up trash in the ocean. That's good. And about it, just allow me one more minute to to say that even when we see plastic on the shores, on the rivers, or when we go swimming, just think about that that's a really small, small percent of the whole plastic pollution that arrives to the ocean and that, that goes deep. So when I go really deep exploring the deep seabed, I find a lot of trash, a lot of plastic, a lot of uh, waste. And these things cannot be removed from the seabed because it's really far from the surface. It's uh, it's complicated, we don't have the right technology. So this is really important to keep in mind. We should reduce the use of single-use plastic, for example. It's much easier than clean, than cleaning after. So it's much better not to get dirty rather than clean after, right? Mm -hmm. So we, we should just keep this in mind. That is a great point. Thank you for making that one. And thank you students so much for your ideas and for sharing them with us. Let's see, did I miss any others? I think we have some great ideas coming in from YouTube too. Jessica is saying to clean up trash, donate money, right? Pick a foundation maybe that's doing the work and, and help support them. Let's see, um, Jeanette on YouTube is saying regulate deep sea fishing. Um, create, uh, Jessica is saying create robots that could help clean up trash and yeah, like get innovative with our solutions. Let's see here. Let's share one more. Oh, Victoria's Homeschool. Hi, everyone. They're saying we could use our social media accounts to tell the stories of Black Coral Forest. I love this one because the power, there's real power in social media and spreading the word. All right. Thank you, everybody, for sharing. And thank you so much, Giovanni, for joining us and taking us into the field with you. We're going to kick off the Q&A portion of the show now. So if you are watching online, send us your questions in the chat bar. We record them all as they're sent in. So please only send each question once. And teachers, let us know who's asking the question so that we can give your class or your student a shout out. And if you are an on-screen guest, get ready with a nice loud voice. And I will tell you when it's your turn to ask a question. So let's kick things off um, with a YouTube question, actually. We have Jeanette wondering... Um, her students would like to know if you have seen any bleached coral beds in your in your studies. Oh, that's a great question. So that means your students are already into it because bleaching is one of the main issues that shallow water reefs are facing. So the shallow water corals, they can be really colorful, as you saw in my first video. But then sometimes they can become totally white. And so that's this phenomenon is known as bleaching coral bleaching they became white and this in most of the time most of the times this means that the corals is is going to die soon sometimes they can recover but not not a lot of recovering actually i've been in expedition recently in the um, in indonesia and then in the maldives and one of the things we were assessing was the amount of coral bleaching and what i'm going to tell you we were surprised not to see that much of bleaching. So it means the reef is somehow recovering and this is really an encouraging sign. So yes, we see some bleaching, but not that much for a uh, coral reef. Black mm -hmm. corals, as you saw in the picture, they are already white and that's a bit challenging because you cannot really tell when they are stressed because they are, are already white. So they don't bleach, they just die if they are stressed. So. Mm -hmm. For this, we pay a lot of attention towards black corals. All right. Adeline on YouTube would like to know, what is the your favorite animal that you see in the coral reefs or while you're down in the depths? 
Well, that's a really challenging question. <laughs> it's really difficult to answer because I love all of them. But sometimes, you know, the seahorses that you've seen before, well, they are among my favorite for sure. I really love to dive deep into the uh, the coral colonies and search for these little tiny animals. They are less than a millimeter long. So they are really, really small, but they are so cute. And yeah, so they are among my favorite for sure besides coral, that they are the first one, mm -hmm. <laughs> corals. Is it almost hard to see the seahorses? Like, could you, do they kind of look like just little particles? They they look like exactly like a small branch of the coral. So you gotta know, they you, you, you already need to know that they are there. So you have to search for them in detail. Otherwise you will just skip them. Makes it all the more special when you do spot one. It's special. <laughs> Okay, the Ash Family Homeschool on YouTube, they want to know if you got to name that black coral forest that you discovered that you took us through. That's the most fun part of my job, actually, when you have to give name to new stuff. So I I got to name in my career different new species. And so you discover a new species and you've got to name it. Or when you find a new forest, if it's really big, yes, you get the credits to name it. And that's fun. Wow. What is the name? Could you share it with us or is it top secret? <laughs> <laughs> no, it depends. It depends a lot. So uh, sometimes you try, you, you find um, a main uh, meaning in the name of a specific species, for example. So uh, you give a name in Latin, la names are in Latin for new species, or sometimes you just dedicate it to, to someone. Mm. And so, for example, in, in the Black Corals, I showed you there, that's uh, that was found in a specific archipelago, which is Egadi Island, uh, and it's um, a really nice place. I've been through lately for this exploration, so we called it the Egadi uh, Black Coral Forest, for example. Awesome! Thanks for explaining. Probably. And that's so exciting. I love that question, <laughs> but it's a struggle for me. <laughs> Okay, Ezra at Risen Homeschool is wondering, what inspired you to start working with coral in the first place? That's a great question. You, that, that's a great question too, Riker. Thank you. Well, I, I came across corals by chance because as every young marine biologist, I wanted to study sharks, whales, or sea turtles. These are the three main, <laughs> main characters for marine biologists. And I was... Uh, the same. And then one day I was working on a fishing vessel to catch some sharks to do shark tagging. So, you know, shark scientists, sometimes they can put a small GPS on sharks to track their movement. And that's what we were doing. And by chance, just by chance, these fishing vessels collected some black corals within their net. And the fisherman just came to me like, hey, we found this tree in the water. We don't know what it is. Just have a look. And, you know, curiosity changed your life because I started studying. I started asking myself questions about what's this animal, what is doing, how old is it? And so I found out, for example, that black corals live really a lot. The coral they gave it to me at almost 1,000 years was almost 1,000 years old and it was alive. So I realized, for example, that black corals can live really, really long. But at the same time, you know, in 10 minutes of a wrong fishing operation that it can be destroyed. And so in 10 minutes, you destroy one life that take millennia to get back again. So in that specific moment, I came across corals and this inspired me to do something. I realized that was my, my task. I said, you know, I'm gonna do something for this. I'm gonna deepen into this. And this triggered my whole work about corals. Wow, that's a great story. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. Thanks for asking. Yeah, all right. We have some folks on YouTube, including Victoria's Homeschool, wondering which part of the world has the most black coral forests and have you been there? That's a great question too. One of the richest places that we know is, for example, in Indonesia. That's why I went there recently. But uh, since most of the deep sea ocean is unexplored, actually, we are not sure yet about the the places that are much richest in black corals. And that's my job. I'm traveling the world to see 
to find the last living black coral forests, to study them, and so to assess which of these places are the richest. For example, in the last years, I've been working in the Red Sea. The Red Sea is between Saudi Arabia and Egypt. And in the Red Sea, no one had ever found a black coral forest. And we knew there weren't black coral forests there, but I gave it a try. I tried to explore some areas of this, this new basin, and I found a huge diversity of black corals, for example. So sometimes it's just a matter of what we still don't know. We got to have a look in many different places, because I'm sure there are many places that, you know, for now, we don't know anything about it, but probably they they have some really nice treasures hidden down there. Thank you. This is a really interesting question from Patricia on YouTube. They're wondering what was black coral called before the first person opened it up and saw that the color of the skeleton was black? Did it ah. have a name initially? Well, the initial name of black corals actually was uh, Antipataria. Antipataria comes from the Greek words anti and pathos. Anti means against, pathos means disease, because they were used since ancient times as amulet, as cures against diseases, against pathologies. So before the name black corals, they were known as antipathos. And ancient people, they don't, didn't even know they were animals. But, you know, these black, weird things coming from the ocean was so rare, so difficult to find that, of course, they uh, attributed it to, to it magical powers of, you know, curative powers. Mm. So the ancient name of black corals was Antipataria. So interesting. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, students, I know that we have many, many more questions for Giovanni, but we're ending or we're nearing the end of our show. And I want to ask one final question to Giovanni. What message do you have for all of the future explorers watching out there? Oh, well, we definitely need more explorers. So uh, I hope there will be a lot of future explorers down there. And my advice always is to be curious because curiosity is what trigger, what can trigger the whole things you will do in your life. Curiosity saves my life and my happiness a lot of times. And soon, guys and girls, it will be your turn to do your part to get this place a more uh, planet, uh, a planet in balance. And so definitely be curious and be ready for when's going to be your moment with the right attitude, with happiness, with a positive attitude and absolutely curiosity. Awesome. Thank you again, Giovanni, for joining us today, for answering our questions and for taking us deep into your work. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. Of course. And thank you, students, for your fantastic questions. And a big thank you to all the teachers for bringing your classes today. We couldn't do it without you. So we are well into the spring season of Explore Classroom, and we have many more exciting events to come. Be sure to check out our website at natgeoed.org slash Explore Classroom to view the upcoming schedule. And when you register, you can request a chance to be featured up here on screen with us. So have a great day, everyone. Stay curious, keep exploring, and we'll see you next time on Explore Classroom. Bye, everyone. Bye. Ciao. Ciao, ciao.